Today I want to pick up exactly where we left off last week and our topic being the blood. Again, uh, just a reminder, we are looking at this, the blood, quote unquote, uh, because of a couple of statements that uh, I get questions about all the time. And those questions are uh, whether I need to plead the blood or, um, uh, you know, you got to get it under the blood or it's under the blood. Um, All those statements being used by uh, people that I minister to. and you've probably all of you have heard it. And if you haven't said it, I, I remember I went through that phase of saying it's under the blood, you know, it's under the blood. And, uh, but from our last studies, um, in the first, uh, four parts of this teaching, which you can, uh, go to mikeheshministries.com and get this full series, which I recommend that you do. Uh, because that's how I teach, line upon line, precept upon precept. I build, uh, and then when I build a house, I put the foundation down first, then I put up the walls, and then I put on the roof, and then I decorate the inside. So right now, you could say we might just be decorating the inside. So here we go. So again, uh, we've seen from our last studies that... um, uh, what the blood was for, the purpose of the blood. Um, the blood being shed was a, uh, a picture that everyone could see. It showed the life going out of the person uh, or out of the animal. And uh, after the sin was confessed on it, it showed that the sin took the life away. We're told by uh, Paul in many of uh, his epistles, uh, this same message, but I'm thinking of Romans chapter six, that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So uh, that's what, uh, that's the blood uh, just simply showed the life of Christ when his blood was shed. And we brought this out to a very important point. Unlike the animals, all of his blood was not drained out. He was, it was just the shedding of blood uh, in, the, in type and shadow with the uh, animals in the Old Testament just simply showed to the, the person there that their sin brought forth death. And so when Jesus died on the tree being the Lamb of God, which we've seen in a few scriptures, that he was the offering that our Father made. Remember, the focus of all the scriptures from the new, in the New Testament, shift from uh, ministering truth through the natural illustrations to what's been provided in Christ. In other words, the focus is moved away from the type and shadow, and it's moved to the actual image, which is Jesus Christ, who is the image of our Father. And uh, so it's moved away from that. So in the New Testament... And it really was in the Old Testament also. It just wasn't because all the uh, people that God was ministering to did not have the indwelling spirit. They did not have that quickening uh, of the spirit from the inside out. Um, God focused on the natural to uh, you know, give illustrations to quicken spiritual principles to them. And so in the New Testament... We see the focus turning to that because we're in Christ, which we're going to read again this morning, because we're in Christ, we have understanding through the Spirit where we don't have to look to the flesh anymore. And again, the blood was a looking to the flesh. It was showing what uh, was necessary to accomplish so that we could have union or we could be connected to the Father again. And last uh, week, we talked about, if you'll remember, this is an awesome point. And, I, and at some point, I'm going to actually do an addendum to this teaching where I'm going to show in a video um, a, the, the tabernacle and Jesus Christ, how they were, uh, how the tabernacle was in fact a shadow of Jesus. And we're going to see uh, how the Father made Jesus, or let's put it this way, how the tabernacle was made 
exactly like Jesus. And it's mind boggling how the father did it and why when you, when you see this picture, you're going to understand why God admonished Moses three over three times to make sure that you make the tabernacle according to the pattern that I showed you in the wilderness. Amen. So this is awesome. Uh, we're going to continue on. Again, we're going to pick up this point using uh, many of the scriptures that I was taught, and probably many of you, the importance of the blood, but uh, and how those phrases came into popularity, although they're really, uh, they're not uh, scriptural. They're not part of our New Testament covenant. There is a remembrance made of those of what Jesus did through the cup, but it's not something necessary for us to be free from sin. It's just a remembrance of that. And the shedding of blood, I'll just pick it up right there. In I'm in Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm just going to reread the verses I read last week. Uh, it says, Grace be to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Uh, what's interesting here, the wording there is very similar to what we saw in Hebrews chapter uh, 9 and 10, where uh, he's pointing us to Christ and he speaks of heavenly places in Christ. What he's really pointing us to is not a location, but actually the spiritual, uh, the spiritual life that we have in Christ things that are far above the natural, the, the, uh, the things that have no limits, the heavenlies. And uh, we, uh, we've all been taught this since we were kids that, you know, uh, you, you know, you pray to God, he's up there. And when you hear somebody say, oh God, they look up to God. But really, uh, God is present all around us through his spirit. And when you know God, uh, our Father, as it's worded here, and Jesus Christ as Savior, then you're in union with them spiritually, and it helps you to understand why Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. And that's the spiritual part of us that's dwelling inside of these physical houses that we live in. No different than uh, the tabernacle was a place where God went, met with man um, so God met with man in the person of Jesus Christ. But once the veil was rent, as it likens that we read last week in Hebrews chapter 10, where his flesh was taken away, which is what the veil represented, was the division between us and God. That our flesh stood between us having that spiritual connection with God once again. And when Christ uh, became our offering not only physically, but as it says in Isaiah 53, 10, it tells us that, um, that God made his soul an offering for sin. In other words, the spiritual part of Jesus was what the Father used to pay for our sins, and the body that we, he was in was just the opening of the door to release his, the spiritual part in him to be judged on our behalf because he was without sin. So that's the point that Paul's making here also. He's saying, uh, has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's a powerful scripture, you know. Uh, I was taught the should be was like something you ought to do. And if you don't get it done, then you're not acceptable with God. But the point really he's making is he's saying, look, God did this ahead of time so that we should be holy and without blame before him in love in Christ Jesus. So in other words, the work that he did accomplished his goal. What was his goal? That we would be holy and without blame before him in love. That includes you that you are whole, God sees you holy 
and without blame before him in the person of Jesus Christ. He's never thinking, oh man, there's Mike. There he goes again. He blew it. Oh, Jesus, what are we going to do with that boy of yours? You know, and, uh, but he's never going to think that about us because he sees us without blame. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ didn't just cover our sins. It washed them away. There's no more judgment against us in Christ whatsoever. So no sin is going to be brought be before God that you commit. He's never going to say, well, there was that time. No, never. He's not an accuser of the brethren. That's the devil. So if you're being accused of wrongdoing, that's coming from the devil. God will always point us to the status that we have in Christ, knowing that the light will magnify the darkness so that we can see it clearly. He said that the light or the truth would set us free, not the lie, not the sin, knowing the sin. You know, I've ministered to, gosh, uh, many, many, many folks, and, uh, and there's a popular teaching out there that really many people have received good things from. In that uh, popular teaching, um, in particular, uh, uh, it's, I think it's called Be in Health. It is, it's Be in Health. And uh, what's interesting is uh, this person focuses on your sin. And by getting free from sin, then you're able to receive healing in your body. And I've heard many testimonies. People have received a wonderful deliverance. But a, a common thing that I'm hearing in all these people that I'm ministering to is they get to a place where they experience some physical change in their body. And then uh, they become very sin conscious. In other words, they feel the burden to live holy, to be holy, to be without blame, or else they'll get sick again. Now, that's, that's the enemy part of it. That's the enemy bringing that into. But God is not going to point you to your sin. He is going to point you to the truth. And if you embrace that truth and receive that into your heart, to where you know that truth, it will free you from any sin that you have in your life and every sin that you have in your life. Knowing the truth and living that truth is going to separate you from the advantage that the enemy has taken in your life and is manifesting the symptoms that you are experiencing. So I think this is very important this foundation that Paul is laying here in Ephesians uh, about uh, our status with God. And then he starts to tell us how we got that status. And how does he say that? Listen to what he says in verse 7. In whom we have, past tense, redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. That's what we focused on last week. So we receive this redemption through His blood, okay? Not in His blood. In other words, we don't have to be constantly thinking of, of conscious of being in the blood like they did in the Old Testament or even under the blood. He didn't say that. He said through His blood blood, okay? It's like a doorway is an avenue to the other side. You walk through the doorway to get to your destination. True? True? And that's what the blood of Jesus was, and uh, the purpose of it was, was it was an avenue to accomplish our redemption. So there's no need for it anymore. It's like when we uh, let's say we go into a place where we're really blessed about being in that place, 
and we have a wonderful time there, we don't go start worshiping the doorway. Oh, I'm so thankful that you let me into this wonderful place. Or you don't go over there and write, this was the way. This is why I had such a wonderful time was because of the doorway. You know, no one would ever do that. That's a little ridiculous, isn't it? So uh, if we focus on the blood, we're really focusing on the wrong thing. Now, if you acknowledge the blood, like we talked about last week, the purpose of the cup of the communion that we partake of, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, where he talks about that, the whole point of that, uh, if, when he's reminding them in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, this do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me, of me, what he did, what was done, not in remembrance of the blood, not in remembrance of the bread. Why do we focus on that? Okay, I'll tell you, it gets you into bondage. I, I did in our How Great uh, a Salvation series, I took three classes and I focused in a little bit on the communion and Passover. And the reason I did that is because there's some goofiness. Yeah, I said goofiness in the body of Christ today concerning communion that puts someone in bondage. And we shouldn't be in bondage. The purpose of communion isn't to, to be drinking the, the bread and the, and the blood every day. But if you're having it every day, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, what's the purpose of it? Are you doing it because you feel like it's necessary in order for you to be free? There's many very popular teachers out there uh, that emphasize that point. You, oh, you sick? You better take communion. Take it every day. Take it five times a day if you need to until you get delivered. How different is that than confessing your sin until you get free from it? What's that doing? It's focusing on the wrong thing. It's putting your attention on, some, on something that the enemy can take advantage of you in. In other words, no longer is it what Jesus has done. It's what you're doing about what Jesus has done that is making the difference in your life. Is that true? Then that would mean that Jesus plus my performance equals my deliverance. Is that true? No, no it's not true. I, every one of you in this room should have said no. Okay, yeah, okay, I guess you did there. And so uh, it, it's very important. If you have a hesitation in your no, then you, I'm encouraging you, I'm not putting a weight or a burden on you. You need to discover the freedom that God has uh, made the way for you in the shedding, through the shedding of his blood, that it wasn't just to cover your sin until you blow it again or until some really tsunami comes along and washes that blood away. No, he washed your sins away with that blood and there's no residue of that blood anywhere. Nowhere. Nowhere. Okay? Nowhere. And that's the point that Paul is making here. He's saying, look, this is the way we got there, okay? And the re a reason, again, listen to the other, uh, other classes, the other three cl four classes, you'll see that all the writers of the New Testament, because of where they were at, according to the, the scriptures that they were reared up under, the, uh, the doctrine that God uh, ministered to the Israelis, the law, the commandments, the statutes, the ordinances that revolved around Christ, quote unquote, the image, the sh I mean, the, not the image, but the type and shadow. And, but, and they're trying to say when they're ministering in this way, bringing those things up like, hey, that was then, this is now, and today is the day of salvation. Okay, so we just gain understanding and revelation of what Christ has accomplished by looking at the Old Testament. So let's go on to Ephesians chapter 2. This was another uh, one of the other places that I was frequently, uh, you know, taught concerning this. 
uh, about, um, what would you say, you know, the confession about pleading the blood or getting it under the blood. Uh, nothing is under the blood anymore. It's my sins have been washed away, and I pray that you embrace that revelation too, that it's been washed away. Why would Paul say this, stress the importance of the blood like we need it now, and then in in uh, Romans chapter 8, he tells us, verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. If there was any judgment against you, then what would that require? That would require the shedding of blood. True? But he said in uh, our last studies, Hebrews, not, Hebrews 10 in particular, that once Christ was offered, there was no more need to offer blood again because our conscience was purged from those dead works. And now we're able to serve the living God without consciousness of our sin. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you can run around the room later, but right now let's just uh, complete this class, okay? So notice what he says here. And he's, again, he's going back to point us forward. In verse 11 of he, Ephesians chapter 2, he says, Wherefore, remember, remember, that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Wow, that is one depressing statement. You know, if you don't read the rest, you're going to be like, man, why should I carry on? But then he says this, he says, but now. In other words, those covenants of promise and uh, the commonwealth of Israel, that's past. That is past, okay? Notice what he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes or were at one time far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Wow. In other words, it's been done. The blood has been shed in the same way that God had a covenant with Israel that was sealed by the blood, which had to be offered every year to make the comers thereunto um, less conscious of their sin, but not uh, purge it away. But when he sent Christ, it was actually purged away. It was washed away. So he's saying, look, you were far away because those uh, sacrifices didn't pertain to you at all whatsoever. But now that Christ has come and his blood was shed, then now you are free. Isn't that awesome? Listen to what it goes on to say. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition. Uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, hath broken down the... Oh, yeah, I, I got to thinking ahead here. For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Wow, think about our study last week. What was that partition between the Israelites and the Gentiles or you could say in more general, the partition between us and God. What was that partition? It was our flesh. And that was the veil that was rent in Christ Jesus that made a way that opened the holiest of all, us being able to enter into and have fellowship directly with God our Father through the sacrifice of His Son. Okay? We could go back right now, and I'll do this another time, but just show the order of events that took place on the Day of Atonement and all that the priest fulfilled 
uh, is a beautiful picture to show what we couldn't see happening when Jesus hung on the tree and then he, he gave up his life. But in those uh, ordinances, in those, we might even call them rituals that were uh, done once a year, we see all that happened to Jesus in type and shadow. And it's beautiful. And I, that's why I want to draw the picture because when you see that, you'll see, you'll marvel. I guarantee you, you're going to marvel at the wisdom of our God because it shows even why your body was designed the way it is. Now, many people with scientific minds study the body and they say, they look at the body and they say, oh, this is why it formed this way. This is why it was made this way. And they have all these reasons why it looks the way it does, you know, why our lungs are in the place they are, why our ribs there, and they explain, oh, this is for this but they really miss the mark. When you see why our bodies look like they do, you're gonna say, wow. I remember the first time, I tell you, I felt like uh, Moses or any of the people that saw the angels in the Old Testament, I fell flat on my face before God and I was just like, wow, 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 amen. So did I tease you enough? Will you be here for that class? I hope so. <laughs> Anyway, I was in verse 13, who were made, uh, but now in Christ Jesus, who were sometimes afar off, were made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the, the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance to make for to make in himself of twain one new man, and so making peace, that, we might, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, for though... For through him, we both have access by one blood unto the Father. See, it doesn't say blood. It says by one spirit. The blood was shed so that we would have access by the spirit and not by the flesh any longer. Do you know each time you bring up the blood in the sense of looking at it looking to it for protection for yourself or for some kind of refuge for yourself. You're doing, that was enmity, it says here. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. See, by bringing that up, what are you doing? What are you, what would I be doing? I would be saying, oh no, what Jesus did is not enough. We must also follow this as well. The blood was important also. No, the blood had a purpose. And that purpose was a picture to all the world to see the life that was in Christ that was given up so that the spiritual part of us could be judged in Christ Jesus for the sin that God placed on his son to make his soul an offering for sin, that we might be freed from our transgressions. Isaiah 53, verse uh, 4 and 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes you were healed. Those are the facts, folks. So those stripes were just his flesh, showing that that flesh had to be offered so that the real person could deliver us from our transgressions, 
to restore peace with God. Amen? That's what that was for. And this is what Paul is emphasizing here. Why look back to the blood other than as the doorway that allowed you to get into the status that you have with God? Amen? Why would we go there? What, here's why we go there. Because we lack confidence in our situation that we're in, that we'll be freed. In other words, I was taught, and, and I brought this up in the very first study, that the uh, first class, that the devil's afraid of the blood. That's silliness, folks. That's the carnal mind trying to explain the things of the Spirit of God. He's not afraid of blood. You know, he conquered the world and has continues to do so through an ocean of blood and tears. That's how he's taken over the world. He's not afraid of the blood. That's ridiculous. Sorry, I don't mean to be blunt, but it is. It's ridiculous. And to be pleading the blood is to be like following after the enemy's thinking. Folks, you're above that. You're greater than that. You have the mind of Christ, the spiritual mind. It shouldn't be focused on the things of the natural or the flesh because the Bible says, the word of God says, for us to be carnally, naturally, fleshly minded is separation from the things of the spirit. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay, let's not focus on something that was given up so that we could have the life today. Amen. 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 That's a, that's such an awesome point for us to stand here with uh, the, the position that we have in Christ. Let's go on to Ephesians chapter four. And, you know, you say, why? Why are you saying it's like really not significant for us? Not in the sense where we need to be conscious of it. Paul brings it up. We can see in three of the four chapters he mentions it. So let's, I mean, three of the five chapters he's mentioning it. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to read uh, uh, some points here that are very important. Um, like the order that things occurred for us to be free, okay? Now, again, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, Jesus... Uh, Oh, let's see. I'll back up for one second. You know, um, many of the people, which we spent a considerable amount of time on in Hebrews chapter 9, about how that, uh, that the, the image that Jesus was fulfilling, the heavenly uh, image, was greater than the natural image on earth. So everyone thinks about, uh, or I was taught this, although it, the scriptures do not bear this out, that Jesus took his blood into heaven and sprinkled it on an altar there, on a mercy seat there. And uh, we see that the, the, the scriptures don't bear that out. And this is one place where show, that really demonstrates the order in which events occurred may, would have made it impossible for him to sprinkle that blood. So let's just pick up there. I'm, I'm not going to go into any more detail about that, but I do encourage you uh, to go to the website and listen to the parts of this teaching, The Blood, at the website, mikeheshministries.com, where you can read, I mean, where you can uh, watch or listen to the rest of that. So it says here in verse 7 of Ephesians 4, it says, But unto every one is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity kept captive and gave gifts unto men. Now listen carefully to how uh, this is being explained, the order of events, okay? Very important. It, and it's very, I mean, it's just common sense. Something that is very, very rare today. I mean, if it was a commodity traded on the stock market, man, it would just command a very high price because... There's not much of it left in this world today, none whatsoever. And this pandemic that we're going through is a great example 
of the lack of common sense that people are, are demonstrating. So uh, let's just follow this train of thinking here. It says, I'm in verse 9 of Ephesians 4, it says, Now he that now he, that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far up above all heavens that he might fulfill all things. Notice the order of events there. He says in order for him to ascend, he would have had to first descend. Now, that's pretty profound, isn't it? Wow. I, I don't think any of us in here would struggle with in order for you to get up, you have to first sit down. True? And that's the point that he's making here, is that before Jesus could ascend to the Father, he descended. And that's what he did to the lower parts of the earth, the lowest hell. And then when he raised up, what does it say? He led captivity captive. Who was captive in the lower parts of the earth? Well, uh, Paul also shares with us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it's in other places, about the third heaven and how paradise went from the lowest, the, lo the, uh, the place of uh, separation, it went from the lowest parts of the earth and it moved into the heaven. How did it get there? Well, Jesus led those who were captive in paradise in other words, they weren't able to go into the presence of the Father because Jesus had not yet risen. So all the saints in the Old Testament from Abel down to the last person to die before Jesus resurrected were all preserved in a place called paradise or the bosom of Abraham. A wonderful description of this Jesus gave us, uh, a vision I guess he had in the spirit or he may have just um, uh, seen it from the scriptures, but the detail he gives about the location of the lowest hell and the place of paradise where Abraham was. So Jesus, because no one was able to enter into the presence of the Father before Jesus, okay, he was the firstborn from the dead, first one to receive the Spirit again after separation from the Father, and he was the first one, he had preeminence over everyone, Colossians chapter 1, and he was the first into the presence of the Father. So when he led captivity captive, he led them out of that place of paradise into the presence of his Father. And because he, was, he did that, he gave us those gifts. And what was the gift that he gave every person that believed? The Spirit of his Father. So those those that were led captive out of paradise into the presence of the Father were, received the indwelling spirit of God or the life of God that made them instantly connected to God. So it wasn't like he had to round everybody else up and put them on the bus and say, okay, here's where we're going. No, he led them out of that captivity through what he accomplished through the Spirit. And when he received the indwelling spirit, God placed us in Christ, as we saw in Ephesians chapter 1. And there is our status, along with all the other saints, from Abel down to, as I said, and up to, you know, uh, up to, you know, now, today. We all, because we have the indwelling spirit, we are in the presence of God. As uh, Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I did want to read one more scripture that goes along with this point in Ephesians chapter 5. I think it's very important. And I'm, uh, it goes along with another scripture that I'll read in a second here. But in Ephesians chapter 5, he says this in passing, but I think it's quite uh, important because he's talking about the flesh. I'm going to read into it a little bit. Um, he's talking about the relationship, uh, the type and shadow of husbands and wives, as well as um, uh, the picture that that portrays of Christ and his church. And he says, husbands, love your wives, verse 25 of Ephesians 5. 
Husbands, love your wives, um, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it by the washing of the water by the word. In other words, there's no more mention of blood in how Jesus is dealing with the church. He's using the water of the word because his blood has already been shed. Then he says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In other words, our status with God in the spirit is holy without blame before him in love. But we, we can choose whether to walk after that nature or not. It doesn't, it doesn't hinder us in any, it doesn't blemish our status in any way or alter our status with God in any way. However, walking contrary to our nature uh, brings, uh, causes us to be double-minded. And in that double mind, we give place to the enemy, whether wittingly or unwittingly, we are giving place to the devil. So Paul is saying that through the Spirit, through his word, God has given us that word to where we can learn to walk in the status that we have with him and live a life that's without blemish, okay, and without spot. And then he goes on to say, he says, so ought men to love their wives, uh, even as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So how does he do that? How is the Lord nourishing the church? Spiritually or with his blood? No, he's doing it spiritually through the word. The word is spirit and life. And then he makes this statement. He says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. See, he could have said we're members of his flesh and blood and bones, but he didn't. He said that he was mem that we're members of his flesh and bones. There's no more blood. The blood was shed. Paul makes this very clear here. And I'm thinking about, um, there's another verse. Let me see, did I write that down? Um, no, I... Uh, yeah, I'm thinking of the, oh yes, it's in Luke. It's in Luke 24. Remember when Jesus appeared to the disciples uh, the day of the resurrection and they were like, they weren't sure what was going on, whether they were like seeing a ghost or not. And Jesus said, hey, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. He said, you have anything to eat? He said, uh, spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have here. Why didn't he say, hey, look, spirit doesn't have flesh and blood like you see me have here. Why didn't he say it that way? Well, because there was no blood. The blood was shed. It was gone. He had five holes in him. So it couldn't have stayed in him. It would have all leaked out by now. You know what I mean? A little more common sense there. How about that? Okay, so then he goes on. Uh, let me, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. It makes the same point. And again, our focus is, is it necessary for us to be conscious of the blood on this side of the tree? And he says here in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, uh, he makes this point here uh, in um, uh, verse 46. He says, how be it, that was not first which was spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. He's talking about the first Adam. The first Adam formed from the dust of the ground, okay? And, and God brought up Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathed into him life, which was a picture of Christ, the second Adam, being raised up out of the earth to bring forth the spirit of life into us. The very same picture is being duplicated here. And he says, the first man is of the earth, earthy. 
The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earth, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such as they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now he's talking about what happens to us after the veil of this flesh is removed. Once we, uh, once we live out our years and we return to the dirt, then our, the, our person doesn't cease to exist. The real person is instantly with the Lord. The moment this breath goes out of, uh, uh, when this breath stops sustaining this physical body. But listen, this is a statement I wanted to read. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. Why didn't he say that flesh and bone can't enter the kingdom of heaven? because there's going to be flesh and bone there because Christ is there. And we will, we will be reunited with our physical bodies if we should pass before uh, his return in the clouds, as it says in uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, uh, yeah, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, so this is, this is the point he's making. He's saying, look, there's no need for the blood for us, because it can't embrace, it can't grab hold of spiritual things. So if we're focused on flesh and blood, we're not focused on the kingdom of God. Now again, Romans 8, important point. It tells us to be carnally minded is death, or to be fleshly minded is death. And it says that in that verse, it goes on to say that that the carnal, the fleshly mind is enmity against God. It says, and it cannot embrace the laws of God concerning the spirit. So the natural mind is in opposition. So every time your mind is focused on the blood for deliverance, you're actually opposing the victory that you've already been given in Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? to realize that, wow, it's done. I don't have to focus on that at all anymore. And remember what Jesus said when explaining things to uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3? He said, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. He said, look, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is the Spirit. And then he went on to explain that the spirit you can't see with your flesh, that you can see the evidence of the spirit moving in our lives or in the world, but you can't see it with your natural eyes. And Jesus was saying, look, stop. He was telling Nicodemus, you can't see the things of God through the natural eyes. You must look at it through the spirit. Amen? That is an awesome point. So uh, I just wanted... Uh, and, and, you know, let me read one more scripture. And so let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6, because this is um, uh, kind of my heart uh, behind this, uh, uh, stressing this point, because, the, and uh, recently I would encourage you, I've posted on my Facebook page, I've been doing a live stream uh, class um, each week uh, with, uh, actually for or with, uh, I guess in cooperation with, uh, Healing Journeys Today. Um, and that is uh, something that was set up by the Hartmans, uh, by inspiration of our father. I've been doing a live stream. In the first three sessions of that live stream, I taught on this very point because if you're conscious of the blood, then you're in the flesh. And God did not give you those weapons in the flesh to defeat your enemy because your enemy is spiritual and you need spiritual weapons to overcome the spiritual adversary that you have in your life. And I encourage you to listen to those. You can go to my Facebook page, my cash, or you can go to Healing Journeys Today um, 
their Facebook page, or I believe it's even on the Healing Journeys Today uh, YouTube channel, and you can catch them there as well. So it says right here in, um, I'm in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Finally, my brethren, in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. God is a spirit. Our might is spiritual. It's not being focused. Now listen to what he says in verse uh, 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the cunning methods of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against that. So why would you use a physical weapon to defeat a spiritual enemy. You can't. But he goes on to say, here's the good news, uh, but we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he goes on in verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the blessed parade of righteousness. In other words, he goes in and describes the spiritual armor that we have And then finally, he says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that's the sword that we have where we don't need the blood. God has given us His Word to defeat every weapon that the enemy would have against us. So thank you so much for uh, sticking with me through this study. And uh, uh, hopefully I will add to this at some point that uh, lesson about the uh, images of Christ and the tabernacle. So uh, that, that concludes this teaching. 